What's up guys? Today we're going to talk about nurse maid's elbow. We're briefly going to review some anatomy, talk about how this injury occurs, how these patients are going to present, what imaging studies to consider ordering, how to treat these patients, and then I'm going to tell you a personal story of mine, which is probably why I love taking care of these patients so much. So quickly, let's go over some anatomy of the elbow in the normal individual because it will soon prove to be of importance in understanding the mechanism behind this injury. The elbow is a hinge joint and it's made up of the distal aspect of the humerus and the proximal portions of the radius and the ulna. Then you have the annular ligament which encircles the proximal head of the radius and it helps keep in contact with the radial notch of the ulna. So, in nurse maid's elbow, which is also called radial head subluxation, a portion of this annular ligament slips over the head of the radius and gets trapped in between the radial humoral joint. But how does this most commonly occur? Well, it most commonly occurs in children between the ages of 1 and 4. And interesting enough, it is more frequent in girls, and it's going to be more frequent in the left arm, but I'm not sure why. The mechanism behind this injury often results from an axial traction, however, to a pronated forearm with an extended elbow. So more simply put, let's say you have a three-year-old girl and she's holding your hand as you wait to cross the street together. Well, let's say she sees a butterfly in the middle of the road that she just has to investigate. And suddenly, without warning, she tries to run into the middle of the road with a car zipping by. You impulsively pull back her arm, causing traction pulling her radius and ulna away from her body and cause a portion of the annular ligament to slip over the head of the radius and slide into the joint space between the radius and the humerus where it becomes trapped. Another common mechanism causing this injury is grabbing the child by both arms and then swinging them around like a helicopter. It can also occur from falling on the elbow, minor direct trauma, arm twisting, lifting the child up by their arms, or even wrestling. On physical exam, the first thing that's going to clue you into this diagnosis is the patient's general appearance. Even before the parents tell you that they grab their child's arm suddenly to prevent the child from falling, you're going to notice that these kids will be holding their injured arm close to the body, have their elbow fully extended or slightly flexed, and their forearms will be pronated. And they're not going to seem to be in too much pain as long as they stay still, but if you move it, it's going to be painful. However, even if the parents give you the classical mechanism of a pull injury and now the child is refusing to use their arm, you still need to do a good physical exam of that elbow, especially if there's history of a fall or minor trauma to the elbow and the child is refusing to use their arm. Look at the general appearance of the elbow and the arm once again, but this time look a little bit more closely. Is there any swelling or bruising or malalignment to the fingers or the wrist? that could indicate a concomitant injury? Do you notice a joint effusion to the elbow or bruising, which could indicate a fracture? And make sure to look at the shoulder and the clavicle to ensure no evidence of dislocation or tenting of the skin, which could indicate a clavicular fracture. After a good inspection, go ahead and palpate the wrist, the fingers, the elbows, and the clavicle as well. There may be some mild tenderness over the lateral head of the radius, but the distal humerus and the proximal ulna are usually not tender. You can try to assess the range of motion, but the child will usually not allow it, and they will experience pain even with very minor supination of the forearm. So now let's talk about how to treat these patients, and let me give you a couple of scenarios. In the first scenario, you have a four-year-old child who presents with a classical history of being swung around by his arms like a helicopter, and directly after it, he's refusing to use his right arm. On physical exam of this child, He's holding his right arm close to his body. He's got his elbow fully extended with a pronated forearm. He's got no bony tenderness, swelling, bruising, deformity to his right arm, but he does experience some pain with supination and he begins to cry. Well, in this case, it's very straightforward. This patient is obviously suffering from a nursemaid's elbow and I can easily make this clinical diagnosis. And I definitely, definitely do not need to do x-rays of the elbow which would expose the child to unnecessary radiation. So now we need to reduce the radial head subluxation that has trapped the annular ligament in between the radius and the humerus. First, let's go over my favorite reduction technique, which is the supination flexion method, and then we will review the hyperpronation method. Now, before you do this procedure, it's important to educate the parents that it is going to be a moderately painful procedure for the child, but if it's successful, it's gonna provide immediate relief 
proper positioning of the patient is going to be key, guys. And place the child in the parent's lap so that they can comfort them during the reduction. So you have the child sitting up, grab the elbow with one hand, and apply a moderate pressure to the radial head with the thumb. Then with the other hand, take it and put it on the distal forearm of the same arm and apply gentle traction. Keep applying traction and next, fully supinate the forearm and then fully flex the elbow all in one smooth motion. A click may be felt over the radial head or maybe even a pop heard to confirm the reduction, but just because you didn't hear a pop or feel a click does not mean that this reduction wasn't successful. The child may begin to move their arm immediately, but they are usually going to be pretty hesitant at first. So I typically leave the room and instruct the parents to encourage the use of that arm and come back in about five to 10 minutes and see how the child's doing. If you come back into the room, the child's playing using his arm, you can confirm a successful reduction and the diagnosis of nursemaid's elbow. No additional treatment, immobilization, activity restriction is needed after a successful reduction. However, I do take the time to educate the parents about how this injury occurred once again and how to prevent this injury in the future. But what do you do if after your initial reduction, you come back into the room and the child is still not moving his arm 20 minutes later? Well, then I would reevaluate the elbow for any subtle signs of a fracture that I could have possibly missed on the first evaluation. And if there are no signs of a subtle fracture, then I would try to reduce the arm this time, again, with a different method. And I would try to reduce it up to two times with the hyperpronation method, which has actually been shown to have better success rates with initial reduction. But as I mentioned earlier, I like the supination flexion method to start off. So if you're going to use the hyperpronation method, place the child in the parent's lap once again. Grab the elbow with one hand and apply moderate pressure to the radial head with the thumb. Then grab the distal forearm with the other hand and hyperpronate the forearm all the way. A click may be felt over the radial head or a pop heard as well to confirm the reduction. But once again, just because you did not hear or feel it doesn't mean that you did not have a successful reduction. If the child immediately begins to move his arm, send him home and once again, no additional treatment is necessary. But you could advise the parents to give children's Tylenol or Motrin for any soreness the child might experience. However, if the second try at reduction was unsuccessful, you can try for a third time and then send them home with the same advice that we spoke about again if it was successful on the third try. But what if after the third try, they are still not moving their arm? Well, then now plain films of the elbow need to be taken to rule out an occult fracture. If there is a fracture, go ahead and place them in a splint and have them follow up with orthopedics. If there is no fracture, place them in a sling and have them follow up with orthopedics in two to three days to reassess the arm movement. All right, so let's quickly go over one more scenario because identifying this injury won't always be that easy. For example, I once had a mother who came into the ER with her two-year-old son who was extremely upset with herself and she was very emotional. She was upset because she had just put her son in daycare and she had gone back to work recently because she said that money was really tight and something like this would not have happened if she was still the one taking care of her son. So the mother wasn't exactly sure what had happened because she wasn't there, but she was told by the healthcare attendants that someone had stepped on her son's hand and that he wouldn't use his whole arm since the incident. Now, the mother could not believe that this is what actually had happened, and she had sincerely asked me if I had thought someone could have physically assaulted or abused her child. Now, while this isn't the typical mechanism of injury, his age, his general appearance, and his physical exam were consistent with a possible nursemaid's elbow. And I thought to myself, well, I suppose it would be possible to have the annular ligament trapped in between the radial head and the humerus if... When the child got his hand stepped on, it was flat, pronated, and extended, and then he most likely reflexively tried to withdraw his hand towards himself quickly, but couldn't because the child was still stepping on his hand, creating counter-traction. So why am I telling you this? Well, because even in the absence of the classical history, if the child's exam is consistent with this injury, and there are no concerning signs for a fracture or child abuse, you can go ahead and attempt to reduce the elbow without getting x-rays, which is what I went on to do, and it was immediately successful. Now, I'll always remember this case, not only because it reminds me to consider this diagnosis, even without the classical history, 
but because after I reduced this child's arm, which was a very straightforward procedure, the mother was so incredibly grateful and incredibly pregnant, she told me she was going to name her son Gray in my honor. So in conclusion, I love Nursemaid's Elbow because parents always come into the ER thinking that their child's arm is broken and they leave thinking that you are some type of Superman. As always, if you have any questions, concerns, interesting stories, if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, you can go ahead and comment below. Or if you're listening to this on the podcast, or maybe you're just more of an email type of person, you can always shoot me an email at gray at physicianassistantboards.com. That's G-R-A-Y at physicianassistantboards.com. 